Welcome, Eagles, to another episode of Trad Cat Night Radio. I am Eric Gajewski, founder and owner of Trad Cat Night, the most viewed and followed traditional Catholic apostolate worldwide. This is also home to the new crusade. Ladies and gentlemen, as I've been telling you for quite some time now, we've been talking about this new world order, this overthrow of Christendom. And today I have a very special guest, and we're going to be talking geopolitics, maybe even a little politics uh, in general. Today I have Maram Susli, and she is also known on the internet as the Syrian girl. Now she is an activist, journalist, social commentator covering Syria, but also a wider topic of geopolitics uh, in general, especially for the online magazine New Eastern Outlook. What I'll do for you all in the description box is leave all of her social media. You can find her on Facebook. You can find her on Twitter, at Partisan Girl. Leave all this information right there for you. So you just click it and you can get right to her information, which is vital. Uh, And so I appreciate uh, Maram taking time out today. I know we got a lot to get into today, uh, Maram. If we could maybe start with a backdrop and talk about why Syria is so important to the New World Order and the Zionists for them to get control of, uh, and then maybe in a more broader sweep, talk about the overall situation in Syria now, the latest developments, if you will, uh, you know what's going on with, with Russia and Putin and things like that. I'm just going to hand it over to you, and I'll work off of you, uh, Maram. Well, thanks for having me on there. Um, I made a video about three years ago, I think it is now, discussing eight reasons why the New World Order basically hates Syria. And Syria is one of the last few remaining countries in the world that isn't completely part of the globalist system, isn't globalized, isn't controlled. And and some of the reasons for that is Syria has its own state-controlled central bank. It's not a Rothschild central bank. And so they manage their own currency, and so, you know, it's depends on how much the people need as to how much they print. And it's not controlled by the Rothschild family, and so people are starving to death. Um, The other reason is, of course, they don't have an IMF debt. So by not having debt with the International Monetary Fund, they don't have to be basically uh, blackmailed by the International Monetary Fund. Um, One of the third reasons we have banned genetically modified food. And genetically modified food, you know, there is this long discussion about the health um, problems that are associated with them. But I think that there's another part of the GMO discussion that doesn't really get as much light, which is that companies like Monsanto, which sell the GMO seeds, what they do is they create a monopoly on the food resources of a country. So Monsanto says we have these special magical seeds that you know will resist all sorts of droughts and insects. Um, but we have uh, a basically a patent on these seeds. Yeah. So if your farmers are going to grow these plants, um, you cannot collect the seeds yourself. Because you you can't reuse seeds. You have to buy new seeds every year. And as a result, when crops fail and, you know, farmers can't afford to buy the Monsanto seeds the next year and they don't have any seeds of their own that they can use, what, what the farmers in India, which are trapped under the system, are doing are killing themselves. And so the whole genetically modified food and Monsanto thing it's just a way to control the world's resources, to control the world's food. Yeah. And Syria doesn't want to buy into that. Yeah, that's a great um, point. Yeah, Argentina recently, too. Uh, we did a whole report on that, but it's really sad. That's a great point, uh, Maram, that most people don't pick up. It's about control and manipulation. It, it goes far beyond just the boundaries of, you know, the food is just actually bad for you. I mean, not only is it bad for you, they're actually yeah. controlling it, yeah. Absolutely. And we need to really talk about this more, I think. Um, You know, also, Syria has a lot of oil and gas, and they definitely want to control that, as they always do. And then, of course, um, Syria is a secular state in the Middle East, um, and it's against Israel. It opposes Zionism and Israel unequivocally, 
and for that reason, you know, the New World Order and the, the neocons want Israel to be in the Middle East because they would like to make sure that there are no secular countries in the Middle East. And Israel isn't secular, it is a Jewish state, and they want only, you know, Muslim states or Jewish states. Um, and they want to make sure, for some strange reason, they want to wipe out Christianity from the Middle East as well. And and nationalism and, you know, people's identity and their culture, basically. They want to wipe all those things out. And Syria maintains all of those things. So that is why Syria has become the enemy of the New World Order. So give us the overall situation in Syria. You know, who are the main players? Um, you know, what's everyday life like out in Syria? And if you could also maybe talk about how the Western propaganda ties into this. I know mainstream media doesn't present the situation as is, and it almost seems like we have to go behind the nonsense and kind of sweep up all of their mistakes and errors, uh, you know, all the propaganda they're putting out there. So maybe you could talk about that for a little bit. Sure. You know, the first thing I want to talk about is we never really get to hear about Syria the way it was before the war began, especially in the Western press. In the Eastern press, we do get a lot of comparison. But I think in the West, there's this perception that Syria has always been at war or has always been this backwater that is poverty-stricken and terminus. That isn't the case. You know, Syria was a very beautiful place. Anyone who's been there could tell you um, we had pretty much everything that we needed. Uh, food, water, electricity, free health care, free education. Um, you know, 95 or something percent of the people had a complete ed- literacy was, you know, the best in the region. Um, it, I've been around the world. I've been to many European countries. And I, I don't see much difference between Damascus, which is the city that I'm from, which is the capital city, Syria and and Rome, for example, um, really, I, I think it was one of the most beautiful places. So to go from that and within the span of five years to go to complete chaos, it's really hard for people to get their head around. The situation right now, you know, you said, what is life like? I'm not living there now. Okay. However, um, I do have family there. And the situation is extremely varied. It depends on which areas you're from. If you're from the capital city, from the central part of the capital city, pretty much, you know, it's still safe. There's still little parties and nightclubs and schools and universities. It's almost normal. However, there's far more electricity cuts, water shortages, medical shortages, uh, economy crisis. Um, and lots and lots of refugees internally displaced from other parts of the country that have been completely and utterly destroyed. And we're talking about cities that would house, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. When I say cities, um, I guess I mean in Syria, our suburbs are like high-rise buildings. So our suburbs are cities as well. And so all of the people that would live in these houses where the battles are going on have all been internally displaced inside the, the areas that are safe, which include, you know, the, the central part of the capital cities and the coastal regions. So who are the groups fighting now? You have the Syrian military, which, of course, you know, is connected to the Syrian government and Assad as your, you know, U.S. media is always... Yeah, demonized. Represented as only Assad. There's no government or military. It's just Assad. Yeah. But it is the government and military. And the National Defense Force, um, these are all connected. The National Defense Force is not exactly the army. It's more like a reserve army where people are basically like Minutemen. They defend their own areas and their own homes. They're not really the, you know, the mechanized tanks and mobile army. Um, so that is one side. Then you have the rebels and the Al Qaeda terrorists. These would be all linked together. The moderate rebels that the U.S. is 
supposedly supporting and giving money to yeah. and weapons to are connected with Al Qaeda, which is Jabhat al Nusra, um, the, the name of Al Qaeda in Syria. And they fight alongside each other, they, they uh, you know, work with each other. And one of the other groups amongst the moderate rebels is Ahrar al-Sham, which the U.S. has refused to include on the terror list because it deemed them one of the moderate rebels. And yet this group was created by um, Dawahiri, which was one of the main leaders of Al-Qaeda. So you have this Al-Qaeda-linked group amongst these so-called moderate rebels. Then you have the third side, which is ISIS. And I didn't mention the Kurds um, because the, the Kurds, as the media calls them, you know, they are not just one group. Kurds, as as people, are just as varied as any other kind of Syrian. You know, some of them have joined ISIS. Um, some of them are joined the rebel groups. Some of them are inside the Syrian military. And and the fourth option would be another so sort of in between rebel group called the YPG, or the SDF, which is who the U.S. military are going in to invade Syria with. Uh, um, and those are the groups. So I hope that sets the scene. Yeah, definitely. Now, would it be your opinion that, that essentially ISIS is a, a CIA, CIA Mossad uh, operation? In my opinion, it definitely... Uh, serves their interests, and of course, this ISIS thing started in 2006 in Iraq, when it was of the utmost interest of the occupation of Iraq at the time to make sure that the Iraqi people were not united together against the occupation, and so they needed to instill in people sectarian violence and hatred and create a divide and conquer situation so that the occupation can you know, continue to control and subjugate Iraq. And that is why groups like ISIS began that began to rise in Iraq before any such groups ever existed in Iraq. And, you know, there's always this excuse that Al-Qaeda was already in Iraq, but all of the experts agree that Al-Qaeda started in Iraq in 2006 under the name ISI, Islamic State in Iraq. And everybody in Iraq at the time tried to fight it, including the resistance movement. Um, but they got a lot, a lot of funding from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And, of course, they served the interests of the CIA and the Mossad. Yeah, I was just, about to, we, I was just about to ask you about Saudi Arabia and how they kind of all tied into this. They're, they're in the news as of late uh, with the whole 9-11 situation. They seem to be a pretty key country. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to get your take on uh, Saudi Arabia, but then also the, the relationship between Assad and Putin. You know, um, we saw Russia go in there, kind of level the playing field. It, it was reported upon here in the West, and maybe you can talk about this, how they kind of withdrew and then, uh, you know, eventually came back to some degree. But I don't know if that's been blown out of proportion. Uh, maybe you can kind of set the record straight as to actually what happened right there when, when Putin said he was going to leave Syria. Yeah, that is a... That is a complicated issue. I'll get to it first. I'll answer the Saudi Arabia thing. Um, Saudi Arabia is a monarchy, and the monarchy, in by law, instills a very extreme, we call Wahhabist version of Islam, which is kind of a, was a very fringe movement, um, and that Wahhabism is the ideology that al-Qaeda and ISIS hold, it is not Sunni Islam, it is Wahhabism, it is, it is its own sort of cultish group, in the same way that, you know, Mormonism wouldn't be considered mainstream Christianity by most, um, okay. this is the same way that Wahhabism is seen. So, with these Wahhabi version of Islam, of course, in Saudi Arabia, women can't drive, that this is the only place in the world, especially in the Islamic you know, countries, where women can't drive. It is only Saudi Arabia and perhaps maybe Afghanistan, but I don't think so. Um, and they, there's a, you know, they have to cover up. There's many, many things. They don't allow to have alcohol, lots of things. 
um, they they are opposed to Shiites, which is another sect um, of Islam. You know, I would liken you know Shiites to Catholicism. I know I'm speaking to Catholics, um, but and Sunnis to Protestants, just because of the history of it, there's a lot of similar history there. I'm a Sunni myself, but you know, I digress. The, the point is that Saudi Arabia is this creature in the Middle East that's very similar to Israel in a way, because of its extremist views and its intolerance of other religions. Um, and they have been funding ISIS because they want to overthrow the Syrian government, because the Syrian government is allied to Iran, which are Shiites, and also because the Syrian government refused to allow Saudi Arabia to put a pipeline, an, a, a gas pipeline, through Syria to, towards the European market, because it, they had already made a deal with Iran for that gas pipeline. So that is Saudi Arabia. Um, the other question was about Putin's withdrawal. The when Putin said that he was going to withdraw withdraw Russian troops and it was mission accomplished. That was during the time of negotiations. And I believe that him saying that was really more a political move rather than an actual move. So perhaps, and I, we aren't, it's, it seems confusing because we aren't really privy to what is going on you know, under the table or in these closed rooms. Sure. But it seems to be like a, a of goodwill um, towards some sort of negotiation with the United States, like, we'll pull back, if you pull back, you know, look at us, now we're, we're, we're pulling out our troops. But of course, it didn't work out, and what happened was, even though Obama was saying no boots on the ground for a very long time, he put boots in on the ground, and Russia didn't end up really pulling out at all. Um, so I think that that statement was just part of the negotiations, and it really, nobody really took it seriously then, and now it's not sort of taken seriously anymore because of you know recent events. But there is there is something to be said also about Syria and Russian relations. Yeah. Of course, Syria and Russia have been allies for a very long time. Um, we you know, decades and decades of history of, you know, respectful alliance. However, you know, there's a difference between an ally and someone you respect and someone who completely controls your foreign policy, which is a vassal. And the U.S. neocons, they have vassals. They don't have allies. Whereas Syria and Russia's relationship is different to that. So that means that Syria and Russian, you know, points of view don't always align. And their interests don't always align. And I suppose Russian, you know, support would also be predicated on, you know, what Syria would be willing to concede to in terms of Russian interests. And I, I don't always think that um, Syria would toe the line. So if we see any, you know, reluctance to support it could be an indication of Syria just drawing its own lines of what it would concede to in negotiations. Interesting. So that's, that's my take on it. Yeah. For our non-Catholic uh, listeners, and perhaps uh, Maram doesn't know this either too, there's in the Catholic Church, there's a, a message that we've been purporting called the, the Fatima message. And in it, she talks about how, uh, this was back in 1917, that Russia would spread her errors, which obviously was communism, but that ultimately... Once uh, a certain consecration was done to uh, the Immaculate Heart, that ultimately Russia would be the pivotal point into destroying this new world order. So that's why we talk about Russia and we we see it um, in, in in light of the current current events that we're seeing right now. And from our perspective, it seems Putin's been kind of holding his hand back uh, with NATO and U.S. building up on on their borders. Then we see again, as we're talking about now, we see um, Russia uh, siding with. Uh, Syria's government, but then you have U.S. backing, uh, you know, the Kurds over there. And, and I think it was on June 1st where you you made mention that you think that we're pretty close to World War III. Didn't you make mention of that, I think, on your Facebook? Yeah, I, I did. I think we've been pretty close to it for quite a while. 
um, it's, it's hard to, to pinpoint exactly when it starts, but yeah. you have to see when, when it comes to the war in Syria, you have two of historically what were considered superpowers, like great nuclear powers, in the same theater of war, only they're not on each other's side. Yeah. That is, Russian and U.S. troops are in the same country, but they're not on each other's side. So we are very much closer to World War Three than we've ever been before, in my view. And especially, you know, since Russian jet was shot down by a NATO country, Turkey, and yeah. Raqqa, the, the battle to Raqqa is, it's, is being pushed now by both Russian and U.S. forces. So it's, it's a very tense situation. Uh, and, you know, it, it's hard to say what does World War Three really look like? Because if you look around the world right now, there has been a constant barrage of wars. Yeah. War after war since September 11. And maybe... Maybe the, we're in it. It's not as we imagined it. Maybe it's not going to be nuclear bombs flying off everywhere. But there are millions of people dying. And it's only a matter of time until it actually spreads to the West as well. Now, over here in the West, we see this a lot, uh, and I don't know if it's propaganda or not. I, I, I believe from your perspective, uh, you think it is. We, we always constantly see women picking up to arms and fighting ISIS. I mean, is there an agenda behind that? I mean, what, what's going on with that? I, I can't figure that that out from, the, you know, from our perspective, from the Western perspective. Okay, no, like that, I wouldn't say that that's propaganda, um, but I believe that, I mean, it is based on truth, but... Of course, the media only shows one side of it um, and for their own agenda. So there are women, of course, fighting ISIS, and there are women in the Syrian um, National Defense Force and in the Syrian military. There's always been Syrian women in the Syrian military since decades and decades ago. It's not because of the war. But also the um, Syrian military National Defense Force has women, um, and one of the factions of the National Defense Force, which is, you know, the Minutemen who are concentrated in their various regions, is members of the Assyrian uh, National Defense Force. The, the Assyrian militia is called Sutoro, and they have women members as well, and they are in the northeast region of Syria, and they are fighting ISIS. So definitely, you know, it's, it is the case the media chooses to concentrate only and singularly on the women in the Kurdish movements, the YPG, fighting ISIS. That, that, those are the only women, according to the Western media, that are fighting ISIS, which isn't true. I mean, the Syrian military has women, the, um, you know, as I said, the NDF, the Assyrian Christians have women fighting in, in them as well. Also, ISIS has women fighting amongst their ranks. Huh. ISIS have these women in black, completely black, with Kalashnikovs walking around Raqqa, you know, pushing people around and, and telling them how they should dress or whether they should pay money. You know, so maybe they don't have them as frontliners, but they do yeah. definitely have armed women as well. So it's it's not like a not necessarily. A feminist thing, they try to portray it as, oh, look, it's feminism, ISIS is afraid of getting killed by women. That, this is really just ridiculous. You know, the ISIS women are just as vile as the ISIS men. So we shouldn't treat men and women differently like that. Um, with the Kurdish groups, they have been, uh, such as the YPG and the SDF, which is the U.S. military is joining, you know, in the fight towards Raqqa, they've been actually recruiting women and girls for decades um, into their militia. And in fact, some of the time they kidnap these girls by, when they're age 12 and recruit them into this militia and then, you know, tell their parents, well, now that they're recruited, you know, they're going to be in the training camps and you really can't take them out because that would be treason. Yeah. You know, it's 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 much more complicated than the media is trying to portray, and it's funny because Marie Claire did a story about the brave women fighting ISIS, you and the brave Kurdish women, singing only the Kurdish women. And in that story, in this fashion magazine, 
They had teenage girls aged 12 and 14. Well, 12 isn't really even teenage yet. And they promoted it as a good thing that these little girl homes were armed fighting ISIS at checkpoints. So um, it's funny how now, what, when it you, comes to certain agendas, the media can just turn a blind eye to a war crime. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think they're only pointing out the Kurdish girls? And why do you think they're, I mean, is it just indoctrination of the, of the young females? I think because, two, well, two reasons. First, because the Zionist agenda is really pushing for the creation of a Kurdistan in Syria, and that's you know another long story. Okay. But the reason why they're pushing the women thing is because you know the Middle East is seen incorrectly as this place where women are really oppressed, and the fact ISIS is seen as really oppressive to women as well. So to see that women are standing up for themselves really pushes this you know liberation and uh, pro progress thing and that's why it's positive of course that it, it is positive there there the fact that women are standing up for themselves is positive but there's a difference between a woman and a child so while women standing up for themselves is positive children being forced into becoming soldiers is not positive and yeah. shouldn't be portrayed that way yeah yeah i agree with you now the the race to Raqqa, as you call it. Explain to us here in the West, and for all of those listening all over the world, why Raqqa is so important, not only from a historical standpoint, but also a strategic standpoint. I mean, help explain, break it down a little bit more for us, and help us understand why Raqqa is so important. Okay. Um, with the historical... Hmm. I'm not sure if I'm going to give you the exact answer you know you want to hear. It's more so that Raqqa is important because there's a lot of oil and gas nearby. Okay, and that's what <clears> I thought. Raqqa itself, the city itself, is not that strategically important as much as the airports that are close by to it and the roads that lead in and out of it, which the roads get to the borders, um, which is um, Azaz and you know, the Kamishli, so, and of course, the border with Iraq. So the, the roads that lead out of Raqqa, Raqqa also lead to Aleppo. And because these roads are important in wars, because you can move your troops around using them. Um, and so, you know, Raqqa is important for that reason. The airports around Raqqa is important because they allow you to have air supremacy. You can fly your planes out of them. You can, you know, bomb ISIS from those airports, and you can put your air defenses there, which prevents foreign planes yeah. from coming into your airspace. And the minute that the airport right next to Raqqa, called Tabaka, which now the Syrian military is, is heading towards, the minute that fell, that was when the U.S. military, as I predicted, inevitably started flying sorties over Syria, because... They didn't want to do that while Syrian air defenses were up. They didn't want to take the risk. So the reason why they're flying over there is because they want to cut Syria up into pieces and create a Kurdistan. Um, and that is what their think tanks were writing about in 2006. And that is what Israel in the 1982 Yunnan plan were also discussing creating. And the reason they want that is... There are actually many reasons. Um, number one, it'll weaken Syria because not only is Syria's oil rich areas there, but also they have a lot of agriculture up in the north. And that agriculture and that oil and that resources feeds 22 million people of Syria, the population. But the, the people that live in those areas, it's actually very sparsely populated because it's kind of rural. And so there's only 1.6 million people there. And they're not all Kurds. Actually, only 40% of them are Kurds. But Kurds are a plurality there, not a majority. That means they are the largest minority, but they're still not a majority. Because 60% is made up of everybody else, which includes Christians, the Assyrians, um, the Turkmens, the Arabs, the Bedouins, lots of things. So they want to give all the oil and all of the agriculture that sustains 22 million people just to 1.6 million of its population because 
that will devastate the Syrian economy, it will prevent Syria from being able to defend itself in future and to feed its population. That's why they want to create a Kurdistan in Syria. Not because there's any historical basis to it at all, because there isn't. Because most of the Kurds in Syria are actually refugees from Turkey that Syria allowed in as refugees, and this can be historically shown you know, if, we, if you even look it up on, even Wikipedia yeah. is, has it on there. Yeah, I saw and, that on your website. As wide source as Wikipedia is. So, um, this, you know, it, this is also can be looked at not just economically and strategically, but you could also look at it in terms of greater Israel, who in the historical text says they control the land up to the Nile and the Euphrates. And of course, the proposed Kurdish region, Rojava or Kurdistan, is beyond just beyond the Euphrates. So that you know that line is um, what would be bordering the other side of Greater Israel, and the they I suppose people who think in terms of um, messianic prophecies, they want to create me- messianic prophecies to get their Messiah to come. So they'd like to create their greater Israel, yeah. and also they want to wipe out the Assyrians, the Assyrian Christians, because they have a you know a bad history. Yeah, that's it. You um, nailed it. Yeah, that's what we talk about all the time here, Maram. I mean, it's, there's no doubt about it that we're on the verge of some very serious events. Um, you know, I wanted to get your take again, once again, ladies and gentlemen. I have with me Maram Susli, absolutely wonderful uh, insights, very intelligent woman aka Syrian girl as many of you know on YouTube make sure you get to her YouTube channel by the way you can find her at Syrian girl partisan nearly 60,000 subscribers so she's very popular there a lot of great information coming out again she's all over the internet just as I try to do red ice radio you know Paul Joseph Watson Alex Jones she's been there done that now you mentioned a a word a few minutes ago um, Maram that I'd like to talk about in general and get your perspective on in general, what is what's with the the quote unquote refugee crisis? Um, if, if if it is as uh, the mainstream is presenting it, uh, you know, is is there a new world order agenda behind that? And then secondarily, a backup question: Israel's role in um, kind of defiance and not letting some of these refugees get into the the, the Assyrian Golan Heights. I know you've talked about this on your your social media, and I wanted you to get. Uh, I wanted you to have a few minutes to talk about that. Sure, absolutely. Um, before that, I just want to make one last point about sure, the sure. Assyrians. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you look at the Kurdistan that they created in Iraq, the Iraqi Kurdistan region, what's happening to the Assyrian Christians there is they're getting pushed off their land and they're you know, having their farms bulldozed. And also in Syria, some of the Assyrian groups have been shot by Kurdish groups. And that is because the, the Assyrians have had a much longer history in those areas. In fact, one of the oldest histories in those areas. And they can prove it using you know, the, the ruins and the artifacts that ISIS is trying to destroy right now. So basically, um, the Assyrians are kind of like a, 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 a chink in the plan of the Kurdish-Israeli agenda. And I think the reason why Israel is so positive of a, of a Kurdish agenda of, of creating a Kurdistan is because, in the, especially in the region of Syria, you know, a lot of these Kurds were refugees, and just so Israel is another country that used to be just refugees that went came into a country and took its land. Israel is composed completely, almost, of people from all over the world. Poland, Germany, Africa, the rest of the Middle East, lots of other places in Europe, Russia. Um, they are a mishmash of refugees from all over the world that descended upon the Levant and Palestine. And Palestine at the, the beginning welcomed them with open arms because of what happened with World War Two and how they were, you know, ethnically cleansed. But then the tables were turned and the Palestinians were kicked out of their home. And a very popular Palestinian by the name Gigi Hadid, which is a which is a model now, her dad posted on his Instagram about how his family took in, you know, these Jewish refugees from Europe and let them into their home. 
homes and then the next day they were kicked out of their homes and kicked out of their countries and they themselves became the refugees. And I do believe that there is an agenda um, to move populations around. I mean, Jews from Europe brought into the Middle East. That's one of the ways that they've done that. Another way is ISIS terrorists from all over the world, including from Europe, also descending upon Syria and trying to take over Syrian land. And the Levant seems to always be the victim, the, like the biggest victim in this, because it's always the one getting its land stolen by these refugee groups, um, now including the Kurds. So that's the third one. Um, so, but now with Europe, with the refugee crisis, the Syria is kind of being used as a Trojan horse. Yeah. And I really don't appreciate that because um, we are being, the Syria Hawaiians has its name winding up to everything. Yeah, it's being demonized. For everything. It's being demonized. Um, it, it, it shouldn't, the word Syrian should not become synonymous with refugee. And that's what they're trying to do. But in fact, a minority of the people crossing the border into Europe are in fact Syrian. Yeah, I completely agree with you, uh, Moran. We've, we've been saying that now for a while. It seems a, a complete demonization. Um, but I want to get your take. In, are there, are there gonna, it seems like they're going to capitalize on this, this quote-unquote crisis. Would you be expecting, a, a, you know, a lot more false flags as we are, I mean, both here, um, you know, in the West and then also there uh, in Europe? I think you've actually mentioned somewhere on your social media where a lot of these individual refugees, I mean, they're not even Syrian to begin with, I think you had ma made mention. <laughs> yeah, because they are using fake passports. But it's also important to remember that every single terrorist attack thus far has involved immigrants who were born in these countries that they took the terrorist attacks in, such as the U.S. and France and Belgium. They have been immigrants there. They, you know, they were raised there. It wasn't actually refugees or immigrant workers at all. <clears throat> but somehow, refugee gets into the headlines. Yeah. And in particular, with the one in France, they miraculously found a passport that was unburnt on the near the bodies of one of the suicide bombers and apparently that passport was a syrian passport and then after the media of that came out the next day the media said oh well that passport was fake and it was probably planted there which is quite obvious so why why plant a fake syrian passport at the scene of a terrorist attack and have syrian you know refugee in all the headlines in terms of like a terrorist attack. It's obviously, I think what's happening is they are um, creating two sides, one side that hates refugees and wants to kill them all, and one side that loves refugees and says, bring them all in. And neither side is completely accurate or looking at the details of the situation. It's particularly, you know, the side that thinks that they're helping by bringing in all these refugees they're not helping, really, because what they should be concentrating on is making sure that Syrians can get back home, which is what Syrians actually want to do. Hmm, and Germany, you know, is it, it's sickening what Germany has done because it has made a special like um, route, like a safer, faster route where you don't have to go through the paperwork for Syrian doctors to get to Germany. Who needs doctors right now, Syria or Germany? Yeah. You know, why are they poaching all of our intelligent, you know, brains? Because I think it's part of a brain drain that the refugee crisis and creating it, this was part of the destruction of Syria and the Syrian nation state and probably nation states as a whole because the new world order does not want nations to exist. Oh, absolutely. They don't want individual identities and... This is really just part of the agenda. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what we've been saying for now for years, uh, Maram. Breakdown of nationalism, breakdown of patriotism, um, ultimately to kind of have a hodgepodge, one world community, uh, if you will. Well, Go ahead. I saw something, I, I agree with you completely, and I'll just say one thing that I saw that it's just one small thing, but I, it had an effect on me. Two Iraqi refugees were on, I think it was American Idol. And they were actually adopted as children from Iraq by a kindly lady who saw that, you know, they were orphaned in their hands. Some 
for their arms have been blown off because of U.S. bombing. And they were singing a song about peace. I think they sung Imagine. Mm-hmm. All the world, you know. Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's no countries, there's no borders and stuff. They, at, at the end of the, the, the message on American Idol of these refugees is that they don't, they don't have any like nationalism or identity that's connected to Iraq or their family or their history. That's all been wiped out. And all that is left is a globalist message. Exactly. So if they use the victims that they created yeah. to push a globalist agenda. I thought that was really repulsive. Of course, everybody yeah. was applauding and thought it was the yeah. sweetest thing they've ever seen in their lives. And they don't see the horror behind the message. Well, which is, it, it's really great to see someone with critical thinking skills, Maram. I have to deal with people all, you know, all day long who can't put the pieces of the puzzle together. And it's really great. For you to pick up stuff like that. They, they really are trying to, you know, uh, just overrun us with this globalism. You know, we've been saying this now for a while. Listen, I, you know, I love the United States as a country. Do I like our government? Absolutely not. Look who's running it. It's Israel. Um, and so would you be of the, the opinion now that I'm thinking about? It? I mean, maybe you can provide even some further details and proof. But, I mean, it seems to me that the United States is nothing but the military arm of Israel that goes into the Middle East and kind of just wipes out areas and, you know, sets up, uh, sets up shop, so to speak. And, uh, and yet it's the Middle Eastern people that are being demonized by the West here. I mean, that's, that's really what the reality is, is it not? I think to be more accurate, I think the Zionist lobby has a lot of influence and I don't want to conflate that with Israel because I think most of the people in Israel are just sacrificial lambs, which are people from all over the world who have been convinced of this Jewish race thing. And so, you think they, most of that most of them are ignorant? You think? I think most of them are ignorant. You know, and some of them are evil. But because I know the I know the Orthodox, they really they're they're repulsed by <laughs> they're repulsed by the you know the Zionists in, in Israel, and actually they'll join alongside with. Orthodox Christians in kind of protesting it. So I understand that, but I wasn't aware that, that, you know, maybe most of them might have been ignorant. I think that, you know, the Orthodox people are, you know, they're really great and they're always at pro Palestinian rallies and they're against Israel. And then, but then you have the non Orthodox ones, which basically they've just been fed this supremacist, like, we're entitled, entitlement thing. Yeah, all racist. Everybody's against us. We're the only ones who are victims. We can't victimize everyone, uh, anyone, and, you know, Hamas and blah, blah, blah. And this is our land historically, etc. But the point is, none of those people are living in mansions. None of those people are this making decisions. None of those people, they're just there. And the, the top Zionists said it themselves. You know, they're there against their own interests. Their interests would be to stay where they originally come from, in countries that are far better off than Israel is, which isn't really even a country. And they, they would have had better lives in their own, you know, countries. So it's not that they're, they're not getting anything out of it, but the Zionists who are in power. You know, the, the, the Jews in Israel, are, they are on the front line. They're the cannon fodder. But the Zionists, who control the banks, who control the agenda, you know, the, the, in during World War II, it was the Zionists who said that one cow in Palestine is worth all the Jews in Europe. So all the Jews in Europe are just a sacrificial lamb for the Zionist agenda. So I do think that the Zionist lobby is has a great influence over U.S. politics, but not yeah. necessarily, be, you know, quote unquote Israel. We can get into that next. Um, that's kind of the next couple questions that I had uh, lined up for you. Maybe you could provide some uh, Syrian perspective on the American elections coming up. It's kind of a divide, so you, you get a, a background of, of the listeners of Tradcat Night. I would say with Trump, there's, it's like a 50-50 split. Some see him as just being a front for the Zionists, meaning he's talking a whole good game, but in reality he's playing along with it to set up revolution here, potentially. Because uh, there will be a, a massive revolution here in the West, I have no doubt. But then there's also others who are like, okay, he seems to be the real deal and to be going against the establishment. So, listen, free, you know, speak freely, however you, you know want to say it. You know, 
Um, but I wanted to get your take on American politics, and then I know you wanted to talk about Clinton, Hillary Clinton here a little bit. So uh, we'll follow up with that. Sure. Um, at least Trump has a chance of doing what he says. Yeah. You know, there's no way, there's no chance with Clinton. So I would bank on the chance, at least of that chance of Trump actually doing what he's saying. He's not, of course, he could be better. He's no Ron Paul. The Ron Paul was great. But he's definitely the better candidate out of the two because really there is two now I think right yeah think. yeah so the lesser of two yeah. evils basically yeah okay yeah and and I think that a lot of what he says is quite good one of the things that bothers me back to the refugee thing is sure. a lot of people saying um, we need to bring in only Christian refugees and on the surface that seems oh that's a good idea because they're being persecuted and number two you know they're, they're less of a less of a risky group, but then what what happens as a result is that you end up ethnically cleansing just the Christians out of the Middle East, which is really still part of the Zionist agenda. Yeah, great so I point. think you know just exclusively getting the Christian refugees in is just part of that. It's it's not a good thing. No. So that's one of the things that he said that I thought mm, that's not very good. Um, but on, he said a lot of more positive things that I think he'd be better for world security and he's going to have less chance of creating a World War Three scenario than Clinton, who is a maniacal, um, satanic freak. <laughs> yes, she is. And I can't really say enough bad words about yeah, her. Yeah, child rapist too, as a matter of fact. It seems pretty apparent that she's... In on this sat satanic pedophilia cult, which we've been we've been reporting upon. I know she defended the rapist to the twelve year old in court. I'm aware of that. Yeah, there was no, there was another one recently that came out, and I can't even think of the name, the lady's name, Carolyn something, I think. Um, but she came out, and she's been saying this now for a while, and even had some some proof behind it. We'll see how that plays out, but yeah, I mean, she seems to be. I, I know she. One of them um, accused her husband Bill of doing something. Is that the same lady? No, this was someone else. It, it came out all over alternative media. Um, I have to go back and, and get her name. I, I want to say her name was Carolyn, but it apparently was 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 blown up. And uh, maybe I can I can probably send it to you privately once we get off here. But um, you know, the one question I, ha I have that I don't think we uh, we got an answer from uh, because I've been asking you so many questions. I apologize. Um, is you know why okay. Isra why Israel isn't allowing refugees into the Syrian Golan Heights? Oh, okay. Well, you know, it's funny how a lot of these um, left-wing Zionist gatekeeping groups are always pushing for Europe to take in refugees, but then they will never push for Israel to open any of its doors to refugees, especially even though it's Israel illegally occupies Syrian land. It is not even allowing Syrians onto its own onto their own land, you know? It's not like they, they could allow them into what is supposedly Israel now, but they won't even allow them onto their own land. And that is because they want to control the Golan Heights. They want to control the rest of Syria. They want to get the Syrians out of Syria so that they could take the rest of it over. You know, it's, they don't want Syrians in into what is the Levant, which is their historical home, because they won't even let Palestinian refugees in, into their own houses, they won't let them in back to their own villages. So why would they, you know, let the Syrians in? They're the it's it's really despotic. And if you look at the the Arabs as well, the Arab countries such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar, who have been fueling this war, they don't want the refugees either, because according to one Kuwaiti politician, they wouldn't assimilate well because their culture, the Syrian culture, is too different to ours. And, you know, it's all, I think they're, they, they're afraid because they just want to, they want to maintain control. That's, that's, the, that's the reality of it. Because yeah. these supposed, you know, these countries that are saying, well, they won't assimilate well. And they, most of their populations are made up of immigrant workers. So yeah, it's, it's a complete hypocrisy. They just, they're allowed to be racist, basically. But for some reason, the West isn't. I but agree with you. They, nobody calls them out on it. 
And they call out, some people have been calling out, you know, the Gulf states on it, but nobody's been calling out Israel on it. Yeah. Yeah, I want to go back to your favorite person in the world, though, Hillary Clinton, if we can, for a minute. I know you wanted to talk a little bit more about the Clinton emails, but then maybe you could also talk a little bit about uh, the Clinton the Clinton connection with Al-Qaeda uh, and how that, uh, you know, has played out over there in Syria. Okay, so Ahrar al-Sham, who the U.S. refused to put on, well, the Obama administration refused to put on the terror list, they have been uh, executing women, um, ethnically cleansing non Wahhabi like Alawite villages. Um, they work with Al Qaeda, they fight alongside Al Qaeda. Um, they made it, issued a statement saying how sorry they were that some kind of Al Qaeda leader was killed. Um, they were created by Zawahiri. The, this um, Al Qaeda group that I'm talking about called Ahrar al Sham was created by Zawahiri. Their agenda is to create an Islamic state in Syria. So they have all, they tick all the boxes of being a terrorist group. They employ suicide bombing as well. But they refuse to say that they are a terrorist group because then they can't arm them. And they happen to be the biggest rebel group in Syria next to Jabhat al Nusra, which is also Al Qaeda. So basically, the vast majority of the people with the largest um, men, manpower in Syria are Jabhat al-Nusra, which is Al-Qaeda, and Ahrar al-Sham, which is Al-Qaeda, even though the State Department refuses to admit it. Except one of their spokesmen said that, you know, he was quoted as saying Aleppo city, which is the second largest city in Syria, is mostly controlled by al Al Nusra, which is Al Qaeda. So you have a US politician admitting that Aleppo is mostly controlled by Al Qaeda, and yet Aleppo rebels are the people that are getting US funding and arms, and it is they who get all the propaganda support in the hope that they will overthrow and overrun Aleppo. And it's it's so funny to see, you know, this after the wake of 9-11, for the media to be so supportive of, of Al-Qaeda, overrunning cities, which we saw happen in Libya just only like three, four, five years ago. So the U.S. Um, State Department sent these rebel groups Tau missiles, which are anti-tank missiles, which are very powerful weapons, and they can, you know, there was a lot of debate about giving it to them. Of course, a few months later, all of those weapons ended up in the hands of Al-Qaeda, which is Al-Nusra, the, the group that was designated Al-Qaeda, and accepted as such. And I think that was really part of the plan, because they really wanted to get those arms to them, but without having a direct way of doing it. So they just gave it to someone else and allowed them to be overrun, so that they can give the, the anti-tank weapons to Al-Qaeda. Um, Another way that they're giving money into Al-Qaeda is they're giving money to this group called the White Helmets, okay. which has been filmed, it's supposed to be a, a non a humanitarian organization, but they've been filmed at Al-Qaeda rallies, and they've been filmed at Al-Qaeda executions, and they have been filmed torturing and interrogating Syrian soldiers just before they were shot. And these people were given $23 million dollars U.S. dollars in aid as a humanitarian organization. So there's there's many different ways that actually the U.S. is directly helping and funding Al Qaeda. And when I say the U.S., of course I mean the U.S. government, the State Department, the state, not the U.S. of A. So it's not just Saudi Arabia and Qatar that we or Turkey that we can pin the money trail on. It's also the State Department who's been doing this. Yeah. And I don't think every single part of the U.S. government is happy with that. I think, in particular, the Pentagon is not happy with it. Yeah. Great points there, as always. Um, again, we're going to start to wind things down here uh, with Maram. 
uh, Susli, aka Syrian Girl. Again, I'll leave all of her information in the description box. You can find her on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, I was actually just uh, going through some, some more of your information here, and I just saw about a month ago you were blocked uh, on or suspended by Facebook, and I've been suspended probably about a half a dozen times now for my various po posts, whether, you know, pa patriotic conservatism, conservatism uh, exposing the Zionists in Israel. I know your particular post was, was covering uh, ISIS, but, you know, no doubt social media has a role in the play with this, with the whole Zionist agenda, Zuckerberg, we know about that. We have to ask the fundamental question, and you prose this a lot too, uh, Maram, you know, why ISIS is attacking all these you know, different places, but doesn't attack Israel. <laughs> I mean, that's a, a question that everyone should be asking themselves. Uh, and perhaps you can go into that a little bit. Uh, but next, I, I wanted to cover the the Turkey connection, Turkey-ISIS connection. I've had on uh, a friend of mine, Shubat.com, uh, um, what's his name, Theodore. I've had him on several times now. He covers Islamic jih jihadism and, and ISIS and all that. And, you know, f for them, they seem to think that possibly uh, there's a, a, a new arise of the, of the Ottoman Empire. I'm not sure. There's a lot of people kind of 50-50 on that. Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. But just Turkey's kind of um, its role in, in kind of leading uh, ISIS, if you will. So that is probably the dream of Erdogan, which is Turkey's president, is to reinstate the Ottoman Empire and control... Syria again, and some of the assets that they use are the Turkmen's group called the um, the Grey Wolves, okay. which was part of the NATO Gladio, you know, operation back in the Cold War era. One of the groups that was left over from the Cold War is still one of their assets. They also allow. They also basically allowed all of the rebels, insurgents, including ISIS. To cross into Syria since the start of the war, um, they allowed them to cross out. They created safe zones and um, camps for their families to have refuge in on the borders of Turkey, so that they could have you know their families safe while they go off to fight, um, and then they can come back and recuperate and get medical treatment and food and whatnot. They allow supply of of, of weapons and food to flow through their borders. They give them air cover. They shoot down Syrian jets that are chasing down Al Qaeda, and that is why this Russian military air force had to get involved, and they got involved near the Turkish border because Turkey was wasn't allowing Syrian planes to get close yeah. to their border. They would shoot them down in order to protect Al Qaeda terrorists from go, from you know getting bombed, and so Russia came in on the under the idea that they could operate in those areas and not risk getting shot down. Of course, Turkey couldn't resist. They they still shut them down because their Al-Qaeda assets were just so important. Um, and Turkish border guards have been filmed twice now interacting with ISIS terrorists. Also, on that note, Israeli soldiers were filmed interacting with Al-Qaeda terrorists on the Golan Heights border. Yeah, I saw that. But that's a different story, yeah. So... It's obvious that Turkey's interest is being served by these Al Qaeda and ISIS terrorists, and that it's allowing them through the border, um, getting their, you know, selling their oil and giving them food and weapons, um, and air cover, air support, political support, and the reason, one of the reasons why they're doing this, is because of this oil gas pipeline deal that. Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, refused to sign in 2009 that would have allowed a gas pipeline to pass through Syria, through Turkey, or to European markets. That's one of the reasons, of course, they also want to control the region. So there is the, the return of the Ottoman Empire, but that's going to be difficult with Saudi Arabia and Iran being as powerful as they are now. So it's there is another agenda called pan Turkish. Um, I guess I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, Pan-Turkism, okay. which aims to unite basically all the Turkic peoples going from Turkmenistan all the way you know, through Azerbaijan, um, 
onto Turkey. But of course, there's one country that's standing in the way of that, and it's Armenia. So hmm. that you know, that's another side story. Yeah. Yes, Erdogan definitely has this wish to reintroduce the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, but Pu- it's not going to happen. It's ridiculous. Putin in the past, uh, I think it's been the last three or four months, actually threatened uh, Erdogan and, and basically said, hey, you, you better stop uh, you know, funding and getting behind these terrorists or we're coming down there. I mean, literally, I mean, could we see a day where we see Putin and Russia march all the way down? I mean, is that a reality? Um, when the Russian jet was shot down, I thought that they would retaliate in a way that may have, you know, been an airstrike on specific targets or, you know, like a just one retaliatory strike. But right. I don't think that Russia would go in because Turkey is a member of NATO. And if they do invade Turkey, then they will be, you know, in a direct war with NATO. Yeah. So I, I would, get, it would have been likely that there would be some kind of strikes on targets such as, you know, terrorists crossing the border or terrorists interacting with border guards or um, a, you know, Turkish SAM sites or Turkish military targets that are near the, near the border. But I, I don't really foresee Russian troops going into Turkey. No, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, well, we got to keep, we got to keep in prayer. Russia, you know, to us is, is very key in this whole uh, situation. And, and, and honestly, I don't know how Putin has held back as long as he has with all of the, the nonsense that he has to deal with on all fronts between U.S., NATO, and, and our own government, uh, you know, American. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting when we get onto social media and you see so many, you know, supporting Putin as opposed, as opposed to, Bo- you know, Obama. Who would ever thought, yeah. you know, who would have thought that would ever been the day back in the Cold War days, you know, when, when Russia... Um, you know, it was under... It's thanks to the internet. It's really yeah, it's without weird, the yeah. internet, none of this would have been possible. But uh, as always, you know, we we try to bring special guests on and, and and really get the real situation behind you know the news that we're seeing from the, the mainstream. And today, I hope everyone has gotten the real Syrian situation here, and it's you know great insights coming from uh, uh, Maram Susli, aka Syrian girl. Um, I don't know if there's anything we left out that you did want to cover, if there's any promotional things you want to get out there, but take take time out now in these, these closing few minutes um, to... Oh, thanks a lot. Well, yeah. thank you for promoting my YouTube channel and my Twitter account and my Facebook. I also write for a magazine called yeah. Journal New East Outlook. Um, you can look up the stuff, some of the stuff that I write on there. I also write for another one called Global independent analytics so if you would like to have you know some more in-depth written ways of looking at the politics please go and have a look at those places and look up my name my real name that i've just been this is what i'm choosing to write under rather than my previous pseudonyms so thanks a lot for having me on it's been great all right thank you i appreciate it very much maram and until next time ladies and gentlemen stay safe and god bless